Hey, I'm Alex Rackle from Board Game Co, and this is your month in review for April of 2024. And if you're like, didn't we just have a month in review like a week and a half, two weeks ago? The answer is yes. Generally, I try to do these month in reviews at the beginning of each month for the prior month. Last month, things got busy and crazy and all that stuff, and so uh, I end up doing the month in review towards the end of the month, which does mean that these are like two weeks apart, but we are, we are correctly on track outside of that. That said, though, let's go ahead and dive into the month in review. As usual, this is a roundup of some of my favorite videos of the month, my own videos, other channels' videos the best new games, my favorite experiences, some disappointments. I actually have five disappointments this month. I never get to five in disappointments. This is the first time we're going to go ahead and get so. Get, get, get so. Get so is not a term. We're gonna, This is the first time we're going to go ahead and have that, I guess. But anyways, we'll have links and timestamps to everything down below. Let's go ahead and start off, as usual, with our stats for the month. I have 103 plays logged for April of 2023. Now, in general, I do assume April 2024. In general, I do assume that I have a bunch of missing stuff. In this month in particular, I know there are a few days where I completely lost track of things. I usually guesstimate that I have a 90% accuracy rate in how much I actually log versus forget to log. I feel this month's worse than that, because I feel like I played a lot of games this month, and I'm still at 103 plays, which, again, 103 is a lot, but for me, a lot is usually in the 150 range. I've been on a past few months, I've been having a hard time getting heavily over that 100 mark. So we'll see how May goes. Uh, May's currently doing decently. What are we like when I'm filming this? We're like a week into May, and I have 30 logs, so that would trend towards around 120. So we'll see. We'll see how May does. Might be doing a little better. Either way, it just means I'm busy and getting things done. Uh, the reality is, I traveled a lot the past six weeks before, and so that does mean that I have to catch up and like all those game found and YouTube videos and all those things. Things have to be done, which does cut into gaming time. With that said, 103 plays logged, 51 unique different games, 26 of which are new to me. So 26 of those 51 unique games are new to me games. That means on average, each game is getting two plays. It does fluctuate. You know, usually things that are newer often get a few more plays because I'm trying to review them or cover them versus things that are, you know, the older titles. So if I look at them, like, you know, well, actually, it's a mix. Because some older titles I binge through, and some newer titles I get a bunch of plays in, and then there's the ones in the middle that just happen to be a game I pulled out. Like, I just played Inish yesterday, although that's a May play. But that's I just played Inish, and that's one play, a singular play. Anyways, uh, from that, we have a H index of 5. Speaking of counting plays, an H index of 5. That means at least 5 games in... April, I played five different times. My age index for the year, by the way, is currently up to 10. So currently for the year of 2024, I have age index of 10. That means 10 different games are played 10 different times. And just for full context of how age indexes work, you might have a game in there that I played 30 times. I think I do have a few games I played 30 times, but 10 means at least 10 games are played at least 10 times. To have an age index of 30, you'd have to have at least 30 games played at least 30 times. Speaking of which, my age index for all time, at least since I started logging plays, is 31. And that's a hard number to crack. It's hard to get over those numbers like getting from 31 like if I do an H index at the end of the year if my H index at the end of the year creeps to 33 I'd be impressed with that the higher an H index get gets the harder it is to maintain that especially as some of those games are gonna be games that I might have played a game 30 times and then finally got rid of it but that means it can never grow to have another game grow into that 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 gap I have to have a full new game starting from scratch that brings all the way up so H indexes get harder and harder to get higher the longer you go on anyways past that as far as some of the games I played, a bunch, I'll, I'll, I usually cover all the games I played at least five times, so to that end, we have Terrascape. I got five plays in of Terrascape. I actually plan on playing it more and then reviewing it shortly. I still want to try a few more things. Terrascape's an interesting one, but we'll be diving to that. Expect to review at some point. We have Draft and Write Records. I uh, got five plays of that in. That's a game that you shouldn't expect to review on because I already reviewed it, but uh, the final game I've been playing and enjoying. Castle Burgundy, got five plays of that in. That's a consistent one that continues to get tabled all the time. God of War, got six plays of God of War. Simon's God of War. I played it a bunch. I enjoy that one. Uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that later. Uh, anyways, God of War from Simon. We have Trio, uh, getting six plays of Trio in. That's a consistent one that gets a lot of game time, especially with my kids. I find I usually play with them weekly with my kids. We have The Light in the Mist. I got six plays of The Light in the Mist. Uh, that is a small box from... I always forget their name. Morrison Game Factory, Emerald Flame... Post Curious, Post Curious, that's what, it does, that's what it does, that one, small little puzzle game, and then we have Codenames Duet with 19 plays, knocking it out of the park, I find almost every month there's usually one game that I went a little crazy on, sometimes there's Trios, and there's Crokinole, sometimes there's Codenames Duet, and this month it's been Codenames Duet, I've been playing that like multiple times a week with my daughter, just going back and forth, really having fun, trying to, we're trying to like go on the actual missions, I don't know if you've ever done those, we're trying to go from start to the end with no failures, we have gotten like three or four deep, but we haven't gotten the full five deep yet, I think it's five, it might be six as far as games in a row, each one getting progressively harder. Anyways, that is going to be my stats for the month in general. 
As far as my favorite videos of the month, as usual, these are favorite videos from other creators first. I will note, usually I do rank a lot of the sections. Uh, today's month in review, I happen to not think about the ranking, so take them all with a grain of salt in terms of just they're all the best in their categories, but I didn't actually rank things. But for favorite videos, first of all, we have All You Can Board doing five board games to start a collection and Board Game Hangover doing Creating My Perfect Board Game Collection. This type of video in general, I tend to appreciate when channels do it. I find that to a large extent, they're focusing on the basics to a degree. Like, you know, what would it really take if they had to distill things to start a collection? To, to and, and sometimes it's based on their own personal interests. Sometimes it's based on what they think is good for your average gamer. But I usually find those are great videos to really get to the best of the best within a type. Within a type. It's not necessarily the best of the best because you might not have Twilight Imperium or more games like that, but you often have a good focus on those. So I enjoyed both those videos. You can check them out. I'll link to them down below. We have Do Bad Reviews Kill Companies. This is actually coming to you from MK, MKBD, I think it is, or MKHD, MKBD, I don't know. Uh, Marques Brownie does uh, tech reviews. It's not a board game uh, content at all, but there was some drama on the general, I guess, YouTube or uh, tech review space in the sense that uh, Marques, uh, Marques Brownlee, MKBD, again, I think it sounds MKBD, uh, one of the biggest, if not the biggest tech review channel out there, he reviewed like these a this AI device, and uh, basically there was concern and pushback and backlash. You know, he maybe he killed the company because the review was so negative, and it was in the whole conversation in the general space, not the board game space, but the general YouTube and or tech review space around the nature of review content and who's your obligation to, and do you have an obligation to protect the people who put out a bad thing? And this is something that's always interesting because the reason I'm referencing this as a video that I really enjoyed is, first of all, um, MKBD had a response video, do bad reviews kill companies? And that's where he goes into the nature of what his responsibility is. His responsibility is to his audience, not to the companies. The companies have a responsibility to put out a good product. If they don't, it's not his job to shelter the company. And it's an interesting conversation because he basically put out a negative review and got a lot of pushback. He had a lot of people who appreciated the negative review and he had a lot of pushback from people who were like, you're too harsh on the company. And I find that is consistently true with what happens in the YouTube board game space. The audience generally craves negative content. When negative content comes out, it is both appreciated and gets criticized. Both things are true. If you don't like something, you often get criticized for not liking it, either for how hurtful you were to the company or because other people did like it and you didn't and you're wrong. So it is both the most appreciated content and the most criti criticized content in the board game space, which I always talk about. The, the reality is people seek negative content and then you get pushback from it. You might not be getting pushback from the people who seek it, to be fair. Sometimes I think you are, but very often you aren't. Very often they're different groups. There's a small Venn diagram of overlap of the people who both want it and then criticize you for it. But the reality is re negative content is always harder to do, harder to engage with. And that's definitely true in every industry, but definitely the board games as well. We have Tom Loves Board Games. I don't remember if that's the name of the video, but Tom, I, I, yes, I love board games. Something Tom Vassell basically did a video uh, where he loves board games and talking about why, talking about his appreciation for the hobby, of still being here, of going into the space, of being involved in board games, of how many great experiences he plays a year, of how the, the bad games are forgotten and the good games are remembered, and basically it's a whole long video about his passion for the hobby. I think it's always a good watch. It's easy to watch any content creator and start to feel that over time that they start getting, you know, burnt out of the hobby, or they're just here because they have to do things, or it's easy to read into the intents of various content creators, and I think there are some who are clearly still passionate about being here, about being in the board game space, about loving what they do and loving the opportunity to play games. This is a space, being a content creator, even if you are the top of your line, it is not a very rewarding space financially. It's usually a space that you should be here because you want to be here because otherwise there are usually better things you can be doing. But anyways, Tom, Tom has a video about why he loves board games and loving this general job and appreciation. And then we have I Quit Seven Citadel. This is a video from the channel Neon Gorilla. Great production value. Doesn't put out a lot of videos, but great production value, great introspection. Uh, but uh, he talks about why he quit playing Seven Citadel. Talks about the gameplay loop, how it didn't work for him, complains, how it might work for you, how if he dived into it again, it might work for him. But it's generally a good video to watch. I thought it was a very introspective, interesting video. Whether or not you are a fan of Seven Citadel, I definitely recommend checking it out, both to discover a new channel and also because I liked, I liked his thoughts and presentation around those thoughts in general. As far as that, we have the best new games of the month. Best new games of the month, this one I did actually rank the order of them. Coming in at number five, we have Expressions. Expressions is a small box game. I really enjoyed it. I, I do have concern for the longevity of it. You'll see a review coming at some point. I'm actually spoiling things. I think that 
I, I think a few of the games and the best games are actually going to have reviews coming up, so spoilers to that. But Expressions, I really enjoyed Expressions. I thought it was very well done. I do have concerns about the longevity of whether it'll be a good game for as long as I want, which is a way weirder thing. It's basically, it has similar vibes to playing a game like The Crew, but The Crew is inherently variable in the way they approach it, and Expressions isn't. So I do wonder what it'll be here, whether it'll be here a year from now, but for right now, I really enjoy the little cooperative deduction game you're engaging in. Again, very similar to The Crew in terms of the feel of the game. We have The Light in the Mist, from which I talked about briefly already, but The Light of the Mist from Post Curious. Really been enjoying diving into that. I don't know if I'm going to finish it before reviewing it. I mean, I, I do plan on finishing it, but I don't know if I'm going to force myself to charge through it just so I can review it. I'll probably play like another five or six. It's basically a bunch of tarot cards. I think it's like 20, if I'm not mistaken, 20 puzzles to go through, and then that's the whole journey. You go through these puzzles. There's a first one and a last one. The rest of you in any order you want. I've been going through those. I've been enjoying them. I'll probably play a few more and then review them. The tricky part there is do I put out a review when I'm finished at all, or do I just enjoy it, the natural progress or progression I'll go through? I don't think it's one that I need to finish to change my thoughts, so I'll probably play another five or six puzzles and then put a review out on that, but I have really been enjoying it. I tend to enjoy post curious content. I think they do really good escape room puzzly style content. Coming at number three, we have Spectral, another deduction game. That's three in a row that are kind of little puzzles to a certain extent, but Spectral is another deduction game from, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, from Bitewing Games. A uh, really interesting twist on a combination of area control and deduction. So you're trying to figure things out and then bump people out as you do, but you might not have all the information so things can change. Very interesting puzzle. Again, wonder about the longevity of it. With any kind of game that has a puzzly element to it, I do wonder how much the longevity of the game will be. But for right now, definitely enjoying Spectral, a slightly unique take on the deduction aspect. We have God of War from Simon. I really enjoy God of War. Again, I talked about this in, you know, in my video already, and I showed you back, I gave my overall first impressions review. I do have concerns about aspects of God of War as to whether it'll be a game that I play through a bunch or hold on to for years. Uh, come on titles in general, and actually, I plan on doing a come on ranking video where I go over all their, all the games they have, my overall thoughts, just ranking all the games from, you know, least to most liked. But uh, God of War is definitely, okay, so the reason I said that is, I find come on games tend to fall into one of three categories. Either I don't like them, I don't play them, I move on, whatever, or like, I like that, I don't, I play them, I play them, I don't like them, I move on. Uh, that's option one. Option two is I play it, I like it, and then it tends to stick around for a long enough period of time until something similar replaces it, often another command title because their titles do have similarities within certain categories. And then category number three is I love it, I hold on to it for a long time. There are a bunch in each category. I don't know if God of War is going to be hold on to until I feel done with it, or if it's gonna be one I have for years. But I really did enjoy God of War from what I've played through it so far. You can check out my two back, or my should you back it on God of War if you want my full first impressions of it, but short version is it's my second favorite game of the month. My favorite game of the month is going to be Ironwood. Ironwood from, oh my gosh, I always forget, uh, Anachrony, to carry Mind Clash, Mind Clash. Uh, Ironwood from Mind Clash, uh, Mind Clash Games, uh, I, I really enjoy Ironwood. I thought it was a great game. I almost gave it a five out of five. There will be a review, oh, again. I'm realizing spoilers. The review's not up yet. Never mind. The review's not up yet. Sorry, these are just, these are games I played in, um, for the first time in April, so, uh, they're here, but the review for a bunch of these. Spectral is going to be a review, Light in the Mist, Expressions, and Ironwood are all going to be reviews, so spoilers from that. I really liked Ironwood. I almost gave it a 5 out of 5. I didn't in the end. I already filmed the review. I ended up giving it a 4.5 out of 5. I held back a bit. I really enjoyed the game, but as I played it more, like my first game would have been a 5 out of 5, but there's a, there's a reason I play games multiple times for reviewing them, because sometimes things change or adjust. As it is, I think after a few plays, I haven't played the solo modes and whatnot, really enjoyed through it. I played the solo modes, I played two-player, I played as both factions. I, I've really enjoyed the gameplay experience. It is not a perfect game to me, but I really do overall enjoy it. It's a 4.5 out of 5 for me, the best game of the month. I haven't given any 5 out of 5s in 2025 yet, 2024. I've not given any 5 out of 5s yet. I thought Ironwood might be my first one, but... I've yet to find a game in 2024 that was like, I gotta give it a 5 out of 5, I gotta, but but who knows, that might happen, it's bound to happen at some point, these these things tend, I find every year I have 5 to 10, 5 to 5s, just so far we're a quarter, a third of the way into the year and none yet. Anyways, as far as disappointments, disappointments, disappointments we have, I'm checking the time because I'm supposed to be going live shortly, anyways, disappointments, uh, we have uh, Finding Atlantis, and this is like, so I have 5 disappointments this month, I usually struggle to even hit 3, disappointments is the only category that I, well, I guess, and technically, I guess, any category, most of the time I try to fit five into every category. Five my videos I like, five other people's videos, five best new games, five highlights. If I don't have five, I don't get to five. Disappointments consistently does not have five. This is the first time we have five disappointments. To that end, in no particular order, we have Finding Atlantis. Finding Atlantis is a little app-based deduction game. Again, the review of this will be going up. Again, some of these reviews will be going up later. I don't know. But either way, Finding Atlantis is one that I 
I thought that the gameplay was weak. I thought the deduction was weak and the hidden movement element was not the greatest and the visuals weren't the greatest. The app wasn't the greatest. Everything about the game was kind of just disappointment, disappointing. I would say in a world full of good games that I consistently say are good, like this world's full of good games, there's a bunch of bad ones and a bunch of great ones and the world's full of good games. I thought Finding Atlantis was a passable game at best. I, I was hoping for more from it and was disappointed by it. We have Tangram City which is also, uh, Tangram City is actually like a good game. I don't recommend buying it, I recommend trying it. My biggest issue with Tangram City was I thought the first play was great, and then every subsequent play is basically the exact same puzzle. It doesn't feel iterative or different or changing much. Uh, I, I find that I didn't get those mental sparks of interesting decisions the more I played it. It just felt like the same game every, every time. That's from Mary Rosenberg from Capstone Games. It's a Tangram game where you're placing little Tangram shapes trying to fill a grid. I think it's a fun game. I think you should try it. I don't think you should buy it unless you try it and decide you want to buy it, in which case you do you. Uh, but I was definitely hoping for more for that one. I thought it looked great. I like Ori, Ori Rosenberg. I like Capstone Games. I thought it was a, as a easy win and it was a little too boring for me. Uh, the Pop, arguably the best disappointment I have on this list is going to be Project L Square One. And when I say best disappointment, I mean disappointments are very specific. A disappointing means I was disappointed. It does not mean the game is bad. In some cases it is. Like again, Tangram City is totally fine. I just don't recommend it for buying. I thought it got boring. Uh, Project L Square One, the disappointment there is interesting because I, I think Project L Square One is a genuinely good game. If it weren't for the fact that Project L existed, I would love Project L Square One. I think it's a lot of fun. It's got great little tableau building. I really like the puzzle of Project L. The problem is I really like the, project, the puzzle of Project L more. So the original Project L, which has polyomino pieces, Project L Square One takes the same game, introduces a sequencing aspect, but removes the polyominoes. The problem is I prefer the polyominoes to the sequencing. So Project L Square One, I was excited to try it, and I still think it's a very good game, but I would never recommend it, only because I'd always recommend Project L first. If Project L didn't exist, I think Project L Square 1 would be a great game, as it is Project L Square 1 is just eclipsed by its older brother. I, I do find this happens a lot in board game reviews, where sometimes I can, recomm I can recommend, so let's give examples, for example. I can, I can sometimes more easily recommend a 3.5 over a 4 if the 3.5 is unique versus if the 4 is just a worse version of a 4.5 or a 5, which is, it does happen. It doesn't happen a lot, but I do find that kind of situation can happen where I'm like, I see no reason to recommend this. I'm sorry. It's just worse than it's previous version. So yeah, that's in the case of Project L Square 1. We also have Finding Finley. Finding Finley is a little uh, deduction game of trying to figure things out based on certain clues and trading clues. Kind of a kid version of Awkward Guess, I'd almost call it. I thought that the clues were not the greatest, though. I thought that it was a tricky game where the actual puzzle of the clues of how they operate and what they do was confusing and definitely not kid or family friendly, especially when you combine it with just confusing clues that aren't necessarily obvious. So, and also a lot of peering and peeking at a map and trying to find landmarks. So overall for me, it was unfortunately a, a miss. It was from a, yeah, I, I, it was a miss. I thought it was a cool concept, but it's a cool concept that's been done better. And this was just a trying to make it family friendly and compromising along the way. I'd say if you want a game like it, try the series of The Key. The Key the key or Not uh, from Haba Games does that kind of game better. And then lastly, this Tannis. Tannis from uh, Phil Walker Harding for Eagle Griffin Games. I generally find that Phil Walker Harding games are almost always going to be at least a 3.5 out of 5 for me. Sometimes they're higher, but they're always good. Tannis was the first that I was like, I don't know. I don't need to play this. This was this is like kind of boring. It, it, felt, it felt like there's a gimmick in terms of the way you're placing tiles into the box, and the rest of the game was a little too simplistic and not as good as other Phil Walker Harding games. So Tannis was another disappointment for me. In my favorite videos category, and again, these ones I actually think I did rate them, but uh, it's going from whatever, if, uh, my five, five favorite videos for myself on the channel, so my own videos on the channel. We have top 15 2022 games that faded. I generally enjoy taking a look backs and seeing how things change when you have enough time, like actual time, because... Sadly, months can go by and things don't get played, but like across the course of a, a year and a half, you have real time to analyze or think about how things are. And so I had top 15 games from 2022 that faded for me, games that I really liked and in some way they went down. To be very clear, the video is not bad games. In fact, many of those games I love, but in some way they saw a hit. If you went from a five to a 4.5, you faded. It doesn't matter if you're still a great game, but you faded in some way. So uh, full of some games that were misses and left my collection, and some I think I think there were some of them that left my collection, but the vast majority of them are games I still enjoy, but they, they've seen a hit along the way. Then I have the top 10 games that hurt crowdfunding. This is basically a conversation around 10 games and or companies that hurt crowdfunding uh, by losing consumer confidence, either through severe delays, not delivering at all, or still waiting or whatnot, but just a bunch of issues from a variety of creators. A bunch of comments in that video talk about creators that I missed, that either I didn't think about, I didn't back their games, or possibly somewhere I disagree it's as bad, but top 10 games that really hurt crowdfunding 
crowdfunding. And there are many comments from people who are like, yeah, that's the last time I backed a project on, on crowdfunding. Like, I, I took a step back because some of us sit there and back, you know, I don't know, 20 projects a year. And if we have one failure, like, okay, whatever, it's the cost of doing business. Some people back two projects a year. And if you have one game fail, especially if it's a game you put hundreds of dollars into, that can really be like, hey, crowdfunding is just not the place to go. So as much as crowdfunding will always continue, every single failure does hurt crowdfunding. Then we have eight games to try if you like Zombicide. I'm a huge fan of the Zombicide genre of games, and so I covered eight more games that might be worth checking out if you like Zombicide that have degrees of similarity while also showing you something new. It's a series I have on the channel where I talk about games that are similar to other games and recommend them that way, but uh, I, I particularly like Zombicide, which is why this particular video is here. We have 15 hidden gems from 2022. Similar idea, taking a look back, but this one specifically is looking at games that I liked that I think should be more known or more either well, what, what, one of two things 15 hidden gems is one of two things it's either games that i think should be more known or games that should be more liked one of those two categories so if it's a game that was generally okay received but i think it's great i'll be like i think this is a great game or if it's a great game that you know 17 people have, have got the hands on or whatever it is usually more than that but whatever it is but it basically co covering a bunch of games that i think are less known get less hype less interest but i still think are worth your attention and then lastly my favorite video of the month was five random questions not my most viewed video of the month not by far my favorite videos have nothing to do with views they're to do with how i felt with them but it's a new series i'm starting where i talk about random questions uh i'm probably going to do one or two of these a month where i just go over a bunch of questions i ask you i give you an access to a poll so you can fill it out and put your own answers in there and then uh, the next video i cover the previous answers while giving you five new ones so uh i started the video series off it's a six minute video the next one's 30 minutes long or 40 minutes long whatever it is because i'm doing the answers and the new questions but it's a very quick video just going over here's a bunch of questions what are your answers on trying to get a sense of just the general pulse on the community of what people are like obviously with selection bias at play it's all of you watching the video so there's going to be selection bias but outside of that i'm curious what people's thoughts and answers are and i enjoyed that video and video series which brings us to crowdfunding highlights i only have two here i have god of war and core of discovery that's all i got i got crowdfunding highlights these are the games that the crowdfunding games that in some way have me a bit more interested invested or whatnot and again like i said uh, God of War, definitely very interested in that one. Definitely planning on getting all of it and uh, seeing how far it takes me. And then Core Discovery from uh, Mind Management from Off the Page Games. J. Cormier, Sen Fung Lim, and Off the Page Games. I think Core Discovery is an excellent deduction game, excellent cooperative deduction game with a lot of variety baked into it. So those are the two highlights of the month in terms of crowdfunding for me for April. Which brings us to the general general highlights or whatever it is. These are general highlights. These are not the best new games. They're usually games I've already played, but in some way I want to talk about them because I want to say, hey, these are good experiences I've had. Some of these will usually show up in the most played games, sometimes not. We have Pagan Fate of Roanoke. That's going to be one of them. I had a chance to play Pagan again. It's a game I did get rid of. I realized I never reviewed it, which is a shame. I meant to review it, but I never actually got around to that, which I feel bad about. Maybe I'll try to get a copy and review it at some point. But I really like Pagan Fate of Roanoke. I did get rid of it because I found it was a harder game to table with my group. I would usually win the first time I played, and I... I it was a trickier game to pull back on. So it is one of those games that was harder to table, and when I would table it, I was the one who would play it the most, so I had a better sense of it, and then I'd win. So it just it became a harder game to pull out. Uh, but I had a chance to play someone else's copy. I enjoyed it. I think it's a great game. I think Pagan Fade Roadhog is a... Yeah, I think it's a really good game, and worth... um. I don't know, worth checking out or trying out or whatever it is. Uh, past that, we had uh, How to Save a World. How to Save a World. I played this one for the first time a while ago. This is one that will be will be having crowdfunding coverage around. There will be sponsored coverage, so take into account. But I really enjoy How to Save a World. I'll probably be reviewing it when the final uh, retail copy comes. But for right now, there'll be a preview. I, it's a good game. I think it's a very solid game from... Um, from um, the Burnt Island Games, definitely check it out if you have a chance. We have, uh, what's it called? Four Shuffle. Four Shuffle on the table over here. That's another one that I really enjoyed. I have a consistently good time playing this one. Still enjoy diving into it, seeing how the various patterns can emerge. I saw someone say they do the antelope or deer, deer wolf combo. I don't think I've ever won with that combo, but I probably am not leaning to it as heavily as I should. I've won with a lot of combinations and I've lost two. But uh, deer, deer antelope, I think it's a good source of points. I don't think I've ever leaned into it 100%, and that might be the, uh, the flaw there. We have Terraforming Mars. Always a good time. Terrifying Mars is consistently delightful. I managed to play it three times this past month, which it's a game that sometimes months can go by and I won't play it, but playing it three times, um, I'm happy with that. I enjoy Terrifying Mars. I think it's great, and I'm looking forward to tabling it again. But yeah, the fact that I got three plays of it in, I'm pretty happy with that. And like two of them were in person. One was on BGA. BGA just introduced Terrifying Mars. So I played on BGA to try it out. I should play it more, but uh, two of them were in person. One with the deluxe copy, one with the not. But it's a consistently good game that I still have fun playing with. And then lastly, we have Codenames Duet. I can't play this game 19 times in a month and then not think it's a great game. Codenames Duet is consistently good. Codenames is one of my favorite games of all times as a system. It consistently holds up. I can't wait for them to actually finally introduce the app and see how that goes. 
And with that, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up the month in review because I'm supposed to be going live in three minutes and also we're done. That's the that's the other reason. So uh, in any case, until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I hope you enjoyed this video. And as always, I hope you have a good one.